I want us to look at a piece of scripture here and I want us to, to look at it and let me read part of this for you. I, it's going to be Acts the 16th chapter and I'm going to start in the 16th verse. Once where we were, when we were going to a place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, they put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet to the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there came such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and saw that the, prisons, that the prison doors uh, saw that the prison doors... He, I'm sorry, let me do this again. The jailer woke up and when he saw that the, the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are still here. Amen. You guys may be seated. This morning, I want to talk a little bit about this scripture. And in these past few weeks, we have talked about praise and worship. And we've talked about the history of praise and worship, where it came from, how we got to this point of everybody singing and worshiping together. The concept that worship isn't a position, it's not the position of your hands or the position of your body, it's not a location where you're located at. In other words, we, we can only worship in church or we can only worship when we're playing music that's been recorded or written in the last five years or for some we can only worship with music that's been written, you know, uh, in, in, you know uh, maybe a hundred years ago but nothing modern. So it's none of those, but it's a condition of the heart. Last week, we talked about preparing our hearts for worship. And I hope this morning as you woke up, I was going to put together a little video, and I might do it for next week, but I was going to put together a little video of, of just getting ready on Sunday mornings and getting ready for worship and getting our hearts prepared as we sing and as we listen to things and as we keep our minds focused on good, positive things that the Lord has for us. And so that way, this morning, we started service with just focusing and thinking about the Lord and letting Him uh, speak to us and getting our hearts directed in the right way. And this morning, I want to end this series talking about the power of worship, the power of worship. I know we've all been in situations in our life where we've been at the wrong place at the wrong time, but maybe doing the right thing. Sometimes we're... We're doing things that we think are the good thing, but sometimes we get accused of doing the wrong thing. Have you noticed that we hear a lot about on social media and Twitter and things, we can voice our opinions and we can all even stand up for things that we believe are right and correct, but if it doesn't meet the criteria that those social platforms have, they can take you, they can delete you, they can, can, can not have you on their social platform anymore, and they can ban you for things that you say, even though the things you say are right and true. Sometimes we try to do good things, and it doesn't come out the way that we want to. It reminded me of a story when I was younger, 
lots younger. I was about a 10 or 9 or 10 years old, and I was a friendly little guy running around church. My dad was the pastor of the church. So you could imagine how I uh, felt like I owned everything. Um, but as a little kid, I ran around and did my thing at church, and I was fairly friendly. And one time after church, I was just being kind of fun, running around and doing things, and I had found a little plastic snake somewhere, and I was running around and putting it on the floor and acting, you know, just kind of being crazy. And I came in service, and there was a lady that was talking, and I put it up in her face, and I said, do you like snakes? And when I did, she screamed and passed out. I mean, she was down for the count, out cold, just cold. Well, it freaked me out, of course, being nine years old, and I've, made an, I've killed a person, you know, right in church. I've killed her. I took off. I don't remember what happened, but they had to call an ambulance, and it was a, it was a big thing. And I went and got in the back seat of the car and hid, <laughs> thinking that I was going to be safe down there. And uh, dad, my dad was... Uh, an astrologer, he believed in putting stripes on the sun. Um, so um, we did, I can't remember, I don't think I got to spank it for that. But anyway, I just remember I was, I was trying to be friendly, I was just doing it in the wrong way. I don't know if you guys have had these kind of experiences in life, but Paul and Silas and the disciples, they were doing what was right. They were going to pray. They were going and ministering among people. And there was a, a girl that was demon-possessed, the scripture says. And she was going and trying to disrupt what was taking place. And she did this on a daily basis. So it wasn't like they could avoid her at one time. She continued to do it. And finally, Paul had enough of it. And he rebuked the demon in her, and she was set free at that point. And you read the story, or you heard it. They were trying to do something right, but it didn't work out in their behalf. God knew what he was doing. God knew what was involved with this, but there was going to be some pain that was going to take place. There was going to be some things that, that didn't feel good. So I want this morning just to give you, uh, I don't know why God speaks to me in three points, but I'm going to give you three points this morning. There's going to be other things that I say in here, but these are the three main things that I want you to take away from this portion of Scripture. And I hope this morning this will help you and encourage you to keep going and, and not stop worship, but continue to worship. Number one is this, even good people doing good things can end up in bad situations. Even sometimes good people doing good things can end up in bad situations, acts the, this chapter, verse number 19, the second part of it says, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. Down in verse number 23, it says, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet to the stock. These hardened criminals, they were dangerous. At least they thought that. The, the magistrates thought that they were. I, I, I want to just explain a little bit of this to you, that the Jewish process of beating someone was the same punishment they gave Jesus, which was ca called 40 lashes minus one. And they would, in the same way they did Jesus, they would use a, a, a whip that had a handle on it about this long, and then it was pieces of leather that had been braided together, long pieces of leather. The pieces had been braided together, and at the ends of these braids, they would put pieces of bone and, and, and sharp rocks so that when they took that whip and they would hit across their back, those, those pieces of bone would dig into their skin, and when they would pull it away, it would rip their skin off. Sometimes the people died in this process because they whipped them so hard and so severely that it just basically took their insides out. And you could imagine how Paul and Silas were feeling after this. Just for doing something good? Just for rebuking a girl and casting a demon out of her? And I know you can look at this a different way. You can say, yes, but they took away this man's livelihood. 
They took away something that, that people obviously were enjoying or benefiting from because she was going around, they were making money from this process. But that's just an, a reason, an excuse to, to, to combat this issue. What they did was a good thing, yet they were punished and they were beaten for this same thing. And now these men are thrown into prison and not just in, into the regular population, but they were put in solitary confinement in the center and told them to watch these hardened criminals. These men are dangerous to society. And they even chained them up so that they couldn't move. And that's the situation that these guys were in. And they were in a place where they couldn't get away. I tell you, there's nothing worse in life, I don't think, than trying to do something good and it being the wrong thing to do, it being going the wrong way the wrong direction, the wrong way. Because when you're doing something good, you feel like you're having a service, you're helping someone, you're reaching out to someone. There's a benefit to what you do. But I want you to know the enemy will always take the good that you try to do and he'll turn it around and try to turn it around to be your demise if, if he can. And it's important for us as believers to understand that sometimes in our life, we are going to go through things that are unjust, that are painful, that you can say, it's not right. It's not right that these people act like that. It's not right that I be in a, a marriage that's, that there's no trust and there's infidelity and there's issues. It's not right that I raise my kids in a Christian home and bring them to church and still at some point they decide to go their other way. It's not right that I serve God all of my life and I pay my tithe, yet I still have cancer. I still have problems. I still go through stuff in my life. It's not. I, I agree with you. And you probably have every reason to whine and complain about it and even be bitter. You know what? There's thousands of people that aren't in church this morning because somebody said something or something did happen to them or, or they, they, they read something the pastor did that was wrong or they heard that the pastor did something that was wrong or, or what. And I'm telling you, eventually I'm going to make all of you mad. I'm, it's just going to happen because the enemy will orchestrate it. And I apologize in advance. I'm trying my hardest to do the right thing. I'm trying my hardest to love people. But even as a church, we go through ebbs and flows in our lives. We go through things in our lives that sometimes don't make sense. But God has a purpose. And God will take the, what the enemy means to destroy us with and he'll turn it around for his good. Amen. Here's the second thing. Praise changes the situation. Praise, praise changes the circumstance. Praise changes the circumstance that you are in. I want you to look here at verse number 25. Verse number 25 says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the earth were shaken. At once all of the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had just got beaten and my body was beat up and bleeding and I was torn up and I was in prison, not being taken care of or cared for, as a matter of fact, I was chained and letting the, the blood loss and all of this stuff get in my, and mad because I, I, I had been doing good things, I'd been loving people and helping people and this is the, the, the reward I get for all this. I don't know that I would have been praising and worshiping God at that point. Amen, are you with me? Can I get somebody who will agree with me this morning? I don't know that I would have been too happy at that situation. But for some reason, these crazy Christian guys were worshiping and praising God in the midst of their pain, in the midst of the stuff that was going on in their life. They weren't complaining. They weren't griping. I think I would have been mad and asking God to get vengeance upon these guys that did this kind of stuff. God, correct the situation. I deserve it. I've been a pastor. I've been a deacon. I've been a worship leader. I've been in church all my life. I shouldn't be treated like this. How could a God of love? You know the story. But instead, hear these men that they're in prison and they begin to worship God, singing hymns and worshiping God in the midst of the pain that they were in. And they're telling God, listen, we love you. We worship you. We praise you. I don't know what songs they were singing, but they were singing songs of worship. 
And the other men were listening. And I know they had to be looking on thinking, these guys are nuts because here they are bleeding. They can barely stay away. But yet they're worshiping God and they're praising God and they're not complaining about the situation that we're in. Folks, I go through times in my life, and most of it's on Sunday afternoon or Mondays, that I go home and I just want to be by myself. I got to call someone to talk me off the ledge sometimes. You know what I'm saying? I've got to do that because sometimes I come, sometimes, and I'm not saying this is every week, but it seems like sometimes it is. Sometimes church sucks more life and energy out of me than it, than it puts in. Sometimes I can leave here on Sunday afternoons and, and it's kind of a pastor's thing that we always feel like quitting on Monday morning. Somebody will say, how was church this week? How was your weekend? And I say, don't ask me on Monday or Tuesday. Ask me Thursday, Friday because I got a better frame of mind. Because we go through times. I don't know if you guys are like that about things that go on in your life. After family reunions, after you get paid and you're looking at that paycheck and thinking, I know I worked more hours than this. I'm working and doing all this, and this is all I'm getting. And you guys go through these situations. For some of you, it happens on weekends when your kids are, are gone. They're out doing their thing. They're out living their best life. And you're up late night wondering when are they going to be home and what are they doing. And you're, you're, you're in that process. And we go through these things in our lives that, that cause pain in us. But instead of griping and complaining about it, this is a story that says, listen, you find joy in something that you're doing. In fact, here's the thing. Joy, and I've talked about this, joy is not contingent on your outside circumstances. Joy comes from what happens inside of you. Happiness is on the outside. Happiness is if I get the money I need to, if I get the girl I need to, if I got all that stuff going on in my life. But joy is something that starts on the inside. It's, it's inward. And Paul and Silas, even though their outward feelings were hurt, even though they had pain on the outside, inside they had joy. Because even though they got beat, they weren't dead. They couldn't kill them. They were still alive. And they were still able to praise God. And even though they just got beat up for doing something that was right, there still was this expectation and this joy that even though I go through this, I'm suffering like Jesus suffered. I'm suffering like those who have come before me have suffered. I am being part of that worthy crew, part of that sacrificial crew that says, listen, no matter what happens, I'm going to give him praise. I'm going to thank him, and I'm going to let the Lord, I'm going to give the Lord praise. Amen. You can, you can rejoice in that. The enemy will try to destroy your faith. He will try to come at you in these times. He will isolate you. He will make you feel like you're nothing. You know, the enemy fights you one-on-one. -on -one. That's how he wants to fight you. He don't want to fight you with a church in one. He don't want to fight you when you're here. He'll wait till you get in the car on your way home by yourself and then the thoughts start coming. He'll wait until you're home by yourself and all of a sudden he starts saying, why are you going to that church? Why are you going around those people? They're fake. That's what church is. All them people are fake. They're not happy. They just go because they have to. Why are you doing that? You can have so much fun somewhere else. You can have so much fun sleeping in on Sunday mornings and staying up late on Saturday nights doing whatever you do. Why are you doing that? The enemy always wants to isolate you and he'll talk smack to you while you're by yourself and there's nobody to defend you or encourage you or stand beside you. He likes to come at you alone. So just the mere fact that you walked into church this morning around other believers, you've raised your hand and you've been a part of this worship, it's thrown it back in the enemy's face and saying, listen, you're not going to fight me one-on-one -on -one because I'm not going to listen to you when I'm by myself. But when I get in the presence of God, he begins to work things in me. And God has set up a process in my life that through worship and through praise, I can activate the joy that's inside of my life so that everything else dissolves away because my focus is on Jesus Christ. Denzel Washington this week made a famous statement. You've probably heard it. When he looked over to the buddy that was next to him at the, what was it, the Emmy Awards or whatever it was this week, and said, at your highest moment, be careful. That's when the devil comes for you. 
That's when the, now I don't know if he said that before Will Smith got up and, and smacked Chris. I don't know if he did it before or after, but I know it was part of that conversation. And I appreciate nobody coming up and trying to smack me. I thought maybe last week I was going to get smacked, but it didn't happen. So thank the Lord for that. I got security guards. I got people. They're up in the rafters, and if anything happens, they rappel down, and they're ready to go. So don't even think about it, y'all. And my, we got security outside, all right? So I, we got the real deal. But, you know, that's the thing. The enemy knows when to attack you. In fact, he's got attacks that are tailor-made for you and nobody else. He knows that your greatest fear is to turn out like your mama or your daddy. He knows that your greatest fear is to be discovered the secret things that you do and nobody else knows about. He knows that your greatest fear is to make jokes about your sickness or your weight or your situation. He knows how to come at you and he will continue to come at you in those areas. He's not going to come at you in ways that you're not tempted, but he knows how you are tempted and he'll come at you in those specific things. He has temptations that are tailor-made for you. But here's the thing, even in that process, we've got to find a way that we can worship and we've got to find a way that we can spend time in his presence because in his presence, everything else fades away. I'm inspired by these stories I hear from the Ukraine. I'm inspired to hear these people who are Christians over there that even in the midst of bombing, even in the midst of their churches being destroyed, they still will meet there on Sunday mornings with just a ragtag group of people with no instruments, but they don't need instruments. They've got their Bible, and they'll come, and they'll join together, and you'll hear them singing songs. As the sirens are going off and as bombs are going across the sky, these believers are gathered together either in buildings or in bomb shelters, but they're taking time to worship and thank God that they are still alive and thank God that he is preserving them. There's a lot they could be angry of. Do you understand that? When they see their country being destroyed, but we are gonna hear stories of heroism and, and men and women who have stepped up and served God that's equivalent to biblical times because God is in the midst of them because they are believers and God does not love you any more than he loves them. And if they'll worship him, and if we will worship him, God will take the enemies out of our life. You know what? I don't have to stop and think, well, what do I have to worship God about? I'm in a bad marriage. I'm in a bad situation. I'm in a bad financial thing. I got no money in the bank. My kids are crazy. I got a dog that's crazy that always wants to chew on me. I got all kinds of things in my life that are going wrong. What is there to praise God about? You praise God because he sent his son to die on a cross for you to take away your sins. And here's the thing. He didn't just erase your sins and make them go away. No, he can't do that. He paid the price for your sins. He put his arms across a rugged cross and he let men who were evil come and kill him who has done no wrong. You talk about someone who is in the right place at the right time and gets accused of doing bad, that was Jesus Christ. And he allowed them to put his hands across and he could have called 10,000 angels to come and wipe the whole place out. He didn't need, he didn't need a, a chemical warfare. He didn't need an atomic bomb or, or, or nuclear power. He didn't need that. He had the angels that would come down and level everything if he spoke the word. But instead he knew that if he died, you would live. And so he died on that cross. So you want to know what should I worship God and what should I thank God about? Thank him that he came to this earth and he died for you and he gave you a chance. Thank God that in history, he laid his spirit upon your relatives, your mom and dad, your grandparents. And because of them, you have what you have today. Because of people who have gone before us, we have this building, we have this sound system, we have this opportunity because we live in America. We live here and God in lots of ways has blessed us, not because we're Americans, but because we're his children. That's what God does. And so we praise him because of that. Amen. 
I'm preaching better than y'all are shouting. I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> Woo! I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Praise him. Listen. Praise him until your chains fall off. I know sometimes the older I get, the wearier I get. Sometimes the music gets in my head and I can't, I, it's just too much for me. Sometimes I can be in here during worship or during practice and I go back and just think, oh man, can we just go back to piano and organ? <laughs> but there's something happens when I come in and I get around other people who are worshiping God. Something happens when I get in here and I can watch these people up here worshiping and I can listen to the instruments and I can hear them all and I know that our tech people are helping us to transmit this message out on the web so that other people and even other countries can join in and be a part of this. And I get in here and I see you guys raising your hands. I see you worshiping. I see a smile on your face. And it makes it all worth it for me. But I know still there are some who have come in and you still have things that are going on in your life. you still got issues that you're dealing with. There's been some hurt and some bitterness that's still lingering in your life because of things that people have said. I see people on the web and Instagram and Facebook who have at one point been a part of our church and now aren't going to church anywhere because of something that somebody said, because of something negative, and it fell on the right heart, and those people believed it. And now the enemy has crept in, and he's beginning to destroy their lives. I, I, I know some of you come, and you come with heavy burdens. You come with, with shame. You come with guilt. You come with things, and you come into service, and you worship as best you can. But you know in the process of that worship, there's still things that go on in your mind. But I want you to know this morning, when you come into the presence of God, and you don't even have to be in church but when you are in the presence of God in your car, when you're in the presence of God at home, when you begin to worship, continue to worship. Don't just stop. Continue to worship. Lift up your praise to him. Listen, we all worship differently. We all worship differently. Some people worship quietly. Some people worship loudly. Some people that can't sing just play drums. Now, I'm not saying Paul can't sing, but I'm saying... Some people that don't have instrumental abilities and, and that kind of stuff, they, 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 they still run cameras, they still run projection, they still uh, shake hands with people out here, they, they make coffee, they do things. But while you're worshiping, don't get discouraged, don't stop worshiping, continue to worship because as you continue to worship and as you continue to give God praise, the chains that the enemy has in your life begin to fall off. They begin to drop and you may not even know it because you're worshiping God. You're thanking him for his goodness. You're thanking him for all of the things that he's done for you and all the things you need him to do for you. And as you begin to worship, you notice that all of a sudden that pain is gone, that resentment is gone, that issue has fallen off because you focus not on your situation, not on your pain, but you focus on the living God of the universe who is able, who is able to touch you. He's able to deliver you. He's able to bring freedom to your life. Amen? That's the God that we serve. So pastor, I come into service and I praise him, but I don't feel any different by the time I've left. Should I just stay here all day? Well, you can if you want to. I mean, we'll show you where the alarm system is and you can turn the lights out on the way out. But let me tell you something. Here's the key. Pray without ceasing. Hebrews, and I don't have this up on the screen for you, but Hebrews, the 13th chapter, says this, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. I read this last week. Let us continually. The Scripture says, let us pray without ceasing. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. His blessings and His mercy is something that continues in my life. And I can continue to worship Him. I can continue to give Him praise. I can continue on a daily basis not to stop worshiping Him because as I worship Him, as this Scripture tells me, my chains will fall off and my chains will drop if I'll focus on him and give him praise and worship him and him alone. Amen? Amen? Paul and Silas didn't pray for justice or freedom. They just worshiped Jesus. They just worshiped him. 
Sometimes all you need to do is just give him praise and give him worship. Throw up your hands and tell him that you love him. Tell him. Tell him that you love him and that you need him in your life. Just worship, and as you worship, you'll begin to see those chains fall off. Number three, last one. Their location never changed, but their situation did. Look at this. I want to show you this, verse number 28. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. After, after the jailer said, listen, I'm going to kill myself. And, and, and Paul said, no, 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 don't, 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 don't harm yourself. We, we haven't left. We're still here. We're just not in chains and the cells are open. And then later, the, the jailer and his whole family got saved. And the next morning, Scripture tells us a little bit later uh, on verse number 35, it said, when it was daylight, the magistrate sent uh, their officers to the jail with the order, release those men. The jailers told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. You see, they were still in jail. They were still in prison. But when they prayed, their chains came off. The door swung open. It's a sign of freedom. I no longer have these chains. I'm still in the situation, but my circumstance has changed. I'm still in the marriage, but it's good. Amen? I, my, my, my child is still at home, but she's serving God, and she has a smile on her face, and she's active with the family. I, I'm still at the same job, but now I'm the manager instead of just the employee. Amen? I'm still in the situation, but God has taken care of my circumstance so that now I'm not bound. I don't have the issues that I once had, but I'm still in this earth. I'm still here, but God has just made what I'm doing joyful, and he's brought freedom. My chains are gone. Now I have the freedom to be and do what I want to. That's the promise of God. The promise of God is, listen, I may not take you out of your situation, but I'm going to change the circumstances around your situation. Psalms 23, Psalms 22, the third verse in the King James Version says this. But you are holy. And and here's what it says. It says you are enthroned in the praises of your people. This is obviously to God. And the psalmist here is, is making this proclamation to God and saying, Lord, you are holy. And you're enthroned in the praises. Now, it, when we jump back into the King James Version, the way I learned it, it says that he inhabits the praises of his people. He, he dwells in the praises of his people. You know what that means? That means that in the circumstance, God is there. If I said that island over there is inhabited with people, what does that mean? It means that people live there. Well, this scripture is saying, yes, you are holy You live in the praises of your people. You are present in the praises of your people. In other words, when we begin to praise God, he comes into that situation. He comes into that place where we are at, and he lives there with us. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were thrown into the fiery furnace, and they looked in there and says, how many men did we throw in there? He says, well, we threw three. And he says, well, why do I see four? And the fourth one looks like the the Lamb of God or the Son of God. Why? It's because in your situation, God will show up when you begin to praise him. Amen? Come on, that was a good point. I need somebody to say amen on that. In your situation, in your situation, you may think that it's bad. You may think God would never come into my situation. Oh, yes, he will. But he'll only do it as you begin to praise him, as you begin to exalt him and give him the credit for what he's getting ready to do. And when you do that, God shows up in your situation. And not only that, but he begins to fight your battles for you and defeat the enemy in your life. So listen, you aren't in your battle alone. You aren't in your situation alone. You've got people there that can help you, that will fight for you, that will defend you, that will stand up for you. You have an advocate with the Father, that he is there to help you fight the battle. Lisa, come up here. I need you to help me fight the battle this morning. Come on. I need you to help me. I need you to help me. You're going to represent God, and she's bringing the big guns this morning, all right? I can't fight the battle on my own, but I've got the most holy person I know that comes in loaded with a big gun and she's going to take care of it. So no matter what the enemy brings against me, no matter if I am on my own, if I don't think I can handle it, 
Whenever I begin to worship, I call on the name of Jesus and he shows up with the big guns to handle every situation for me so we can fight and do everything together back to back. She got my back. I'm gonna fight this way. She got the big guns going that way. We, there's nothing that we can't handle when we worship God because he takes the battle over and brings in the big guns and the prettiness to help me out through the situation. Amen? You guys, listen. No matter what situation you're in, thank you, sweetie. No matter what situation you're in, the Lord will fight your battles for you if you'll just begin to praise Him. When you call on the name of the Lord, here He comes. The enemy starts running away. Why? Because the enemy's already been defeated by Him, and the enemy's going to be defeated by Him again. He knows that His future is not very secure when Jesus walks into the situation. And when I begin to praise Him, Jesus walks into the situation and fights my battles for me. Amen? I want you to stand with me this morning and I want us to fight some battles this morning. I want us to begin to worship and ask the Lord to fight our battles for us. We're not in this thing alone. We're not in this alone. But the Lord is next to us. He's fighting our battles for us. He takes over. He leads it. He directs it when we worship. Call upon His name. I don't know what you're going through this morning. But if you'll worship God, He'll fight your battles for you. Yes. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible with you, Lord. Lord, we give you praise. Victory is on the way. The victory is on the way. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the people that I've come here to worship with. Lord, you're restoring us. You're restoring our family. You're restoring my finances. You're restoring my relationship with my kids. You're restoring my relationship with my boss and my parents. Lord Jesus, you're fixing the situation that I don't even know are out there. Lord, give us. Give us the victory. Give us the victory as we worship you. Indwell in our praises. Inhabit our praises. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Yes. 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 Hallelujah, Lord. Come on. Don't stop. Give him praise until your chains fall off. Give him praise until your chains fall off. Yes. This is how I fight my battles. Praise him. Praise him. Yes. This is how. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. It may seem like I'm surrounded. It may seem like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. Yes. Oh Lord. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. Oh Lord. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Thank you, Lord. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight, yes. I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how, yeah. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Come on, see it again. This is how I fight. This, this is how I fight. fight my battles. Come on, give it praise. This is how I fight my Give it praise for your situation. This is how I fight my battles. Yes. This is how. Yes. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. Listen. Don't think that the Lord doesn't know what your situation is. He knows. 
before you even ask him, he knows. He knows what's going on. He knows the desires of your heart. He knows your pains, your hurts. He knows those kind of things because he lives them with you. He cries those pains with you. And I'm not saying that it's not right for us to to ask him and tell him that kind of stuff. But I'm saying that in the midst of that, don't be afraid to worship him. I've had people say, Pastor, why do we got to sing a song over and over and over and over and over and over again? You know why? Because sometimes it takes that many times for you to get in your mind what's happening so that you can focus on what's going on. When I can sing that song and I can begin to pray through that song as I'm saying, Lord, this is how I fight my battles. I'm going to worship you. Even though I'm in pain this morning, I'm going to worship you. Even though it seems like my situation isn't good, I'm going to worship you. Even though I don't want to be lonely. Even though I don't want to be that evil parent that my kids think I am. Even though I'm going through this situation at work, Lord, this is, I'm going to fight my, I'm giving it to you. I'm going to quit worrying about my situation. I'm going to quit staying up at night. Because worrying is just saying, Lord, I'm worried about my situation and my handling it. Listen, oh, you of little faith, give it to the Lord. Don't worry if you're going to sink or swim. Just give it to God and you go on and do what you know is right and let God fight your battles for you and take care of everything that's around.